Welcome to the 100th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Since it's my 100th episode, I have a special guest who wanted to introduce the interviewee, my son, Zachary. I'll be interviewing John Joseph Adams, the editor of Nightmare Magazine. So take it away, Zachary. Um... A few a few years ago, my, I actually started understanding my dad's podcast, and I read a lot of books now, and I really, really like the podcast. This is the 100th episode, so he let me do the intro to celebrate. What he's, who, uh, the person he's interviewing is John Joseph Adams, editor of The Nightmare Magazine. Okay, so cue typewriter noise. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is John Joseph Adams. In what seems like only a few short years, John has become one of the premier anthologists in the science fiction, fantasy, and horror genres. He has edited numerous short story anthologies, including Other Worlds Than These, Armored, Under the Moons of Mars, New Adventures on Barsoom, Brave New Worlds, Wastelands, The Living Dead, and others as well. He is also the founder and editor of a brand new horror magazine, Nightmare Magazine, a monthly magazine published electronically and available for all the major ebook platforms, Kindle, Nook, and iPad. In addition, John is also the editor of Lightspeed Magazine, which is a monthly science fiction magazine also published electronically. John, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. And I guess I should say, because I was going to mention it later in the interview, you're also the co-host of uh, another podcast where you interview primarily science fiction and fantasy authors called Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. So I just wanted to throw that in there as well. Good. Well, um, in, in the intro, I explained your role as editor of many short story anthologies. Can you explain a little bit about yourself? How did you first get interested in reading speculative fiction? And in terms of your career in the publishing industry, how did you end up as an editor and anthologist? Well, I first got uh, interested in uh, science fiction and fantasy basically as a kid, um, as most of us do. I, you know, I, I basically had always been a reader, and uh, I always just gravitated towards that type of book. And um, the thing was, I, I never really identified as a genre reader until I was much older, uh, probably till I was like 18 or so, um, largely because I, I didn't actually realize that, you know, what I liked was actually called the genre of science fiction and fantasy, you know? <laughs> And um, part of the problem was that uh, I typically had my sister or my mother just giving me books, and uh, I wasn't actually going to the bookstore, so I didn't like I didn't like shop for them myself or or go to the library very much. Um, it's actually kind of bizarre that someone who becomes an editor would not like rely on the library uh, a lot, like most people do when they're younger. But um, yeah, I mean, I just relied on sort of hand me downs from my sister, or um, later she ended up working at a bookstore, and so she would get me books there and. Um, yeah, it wasn't really until I was older, um, when I was eight, like around eighteen or seventeen or eighteen or so, and I, I started buying my own books, and uh, I, I really uh, identified as a genre reader. Um, and I, I sort of took a uh, took some detours along the way. Um, you know, uh, I, I started working at a bookstore. I worked at a Walden Books for for a couple of years, and uh, when I was there, it just sort of really expanded my horizons to what kind of books were out there. Um, like I didn't, I didn't really know that there were this whole, there was this whole category of like thrillers and I didn't know, but I hadn't really explored the mystery section. I mean, I knew that one was there, but, um, you know, just like, I, I would just sort of poke around in all the different genres. And, um, as I was reading these various things that were published, um, and categorized in the main, main fiction section rather than science fiction, I, I tended to gravitate towards the stuff that actually was science fiction and probably should have been called science fiction, like Michael Crichton and, and that kind of thing. And, uh, and so like, I, I took this long detour through medical thrillers and I read a bunch of those and that led me to Michael Crichton. Um, and then after I read Jurassic Park, you know, um, I went and read all of Crichton's other books and, uh, and when I was really looking for something else, uh, my brother-in-law at the time, my, my sister's ex, uh, he, uh, you know, he was also working at the store with me and he just, he was like, well, you know, I mean, that's science fiction. I mean, you should read science fiction. <laughs> and I was like, I was, I was kind of skeptical. I was like, well, you know, I don't know if I'll be able to understand it. Like, I, I, it might be too hard for me to read science fiction. And he's like, dude, if you can understand the science in Jurassic Park, I mean, you can handle probably any science fiction novel. So, um, I think he turned out to be right. Uh, 
but anyway, so I mean, that's sort of how I got into science fiction and fantasy, and and you know, just from that point on, I I just sort of took off, and and I mean, I almost read exclusively in the genre, um, and uh, so then. Um, Shortly thereafter, I, I, I really got interested in writing, um, largely because of playing Dungeons and Dragons and um, having this desire to create something. Um, you know, I sort of, uh, I sort of started off by trying to like run a D and D campaign, like as the dungeon master, you know, and uh, and I found that I didn't really like the um, sort of uh, collaborative effort of, of involved in that kind of thing. You know, it's like it was too, it was too random and, and, and hard to plan what the players would do. And I, <laughs> I found that I just preferred making it up myself uh, rather than having them derail all my well-laid plans. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, you know, I mean, I, I decided to just try to write uh, stories. And uh, so the first thing I actually wrote was, uh, was a novel, um, and I finished it. So, it, actually, I, I didn't realize what an accomplishment that was until many years later. You know, I mean, I actually... First thing I started, set out to write was a novel, and uh, I wrote it all the way through the end, and I finished it. And um, you know, it had a beginning, middle, and end. Uh, that's about all good I can say about it. But um, you know, it is pretty terrible, um, and it will likely never see the light of day, uh, at least not with extensive, extensive revision. Um, but uh, you know, I got interested in writing, and so I did that, and I then I started writing some stories, and um, you know, that just sort of led me to uh, to editing eventually. I mean, I uh, I went to college um, late. Because uh, I actually dropped out of high school because uh, I hated school, and uh, like when I was 16, and uh, so I worked in retail for a couple of years. And uh, at some point, I realized that you know I wasn't ever going to get a job that I was going to be happy with um, once I burnt out in retail. You know, I, I wasn't going to I wasn't going to ever find a job that I'd be happy with if I uh, if I didn't like go to college probably. So um, so you know, I ended up majoring in English, creative writing. I went to a community college, and then I transferred to university. And um, it was when uh, once I once I got to university, actually, that I really started thinking about being an editor because uh, you know I took a couple of writing workshop classes, and uh, and I found like I really liked that that aspect of of the of the writing, you know, sort of creative writing, um, you know, working with someone else's story, trying to make them make it better, and and that kind of thing. And then also I I kind of felt like you know I had. I had uh, potential to pick good stuff, you know, like, mm -hmm. you know, like I, I felt like I, I had the beginnings of good taste, uh, you know, obviously it, it got very refined over the years, but, uh, um, and, and I guess everybody it, probably thinks they have good taste, but right. And didn't you work with, you didn't you work with Gordon Van Gelder at the magazine of fantasy and science fiction? Yeah. Yeah. That was after, uh, right after college, I, I graduated, um, in, uh, uh, in 2000, and then uh, in, you know, in the in in the fall semester 2000, and then uh, I moved to New Jersey in, in January 2001, and uh, I spent the first couple months there looking for a job, um, you know, and I uh, I wanted to get a job in publishing, and uh, I I figured that the short story magazines might actually be a, a easier way to enter the field, um, and I figured well I could I could try to get the job at one of those places, and then maybe I could get a job like at a regular book publisher or something, you know, but. Um, so I applied to Analog and Asimov's and FNSF. I mean, they were really the only ones I knew about. And uh, turns out Realms of Fantasy was actually also in New Jersey, but I didn't know that at the time. So, I mean, I, I sent my resume to those um, three magazines, and uh, um, you know, I never heard from Asim Asimov's or Analog, but um, but Gordon Van Gelder actually did email me, um, and he said uh, that he didn't have any openings, but I should check back later in the year. So um, that was like in February or something. And uh, then so around May, I was like, well, I still hadn't found a job and, uh, you know, I uh, wasn't looking very good for my prospects of, of not just getting another retail job. And uh, so I, uh, I said, well, you know, May, it's later in the year. Let me let me give him another shot. And so I, I, I emailed him back. And uh, as it happened, his previous assistant had just quit, um, you know, just given his notice. So he asked me to come up for an interview. Um, and somehow I convinced him to give me the job. I mean, uh, I can't say I really know uh, what, what convinced him. I mean, we, we just met for lunch and we just talked about, you know, we just geeked out about science fiction and fantasy, you know. Um, to, to his credit, I, uh, I will be, forever, thank, be, be forever, forever thankful that he actually uh, hired me, despite the fact that I, uh, I, I admitted I liked Michael Crichton. Um, you know, because, uh, I, mean, he, I, I mean, you know, say what you will about Crichton as a, as a bestseller. I mean, you know... Um, you know, a lot of people in the genre really despise him, and, and 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 like in retrospect, I can see why. I mean, you know, basically because science is the villain in all of his stories, and it's the cause of all the problems in the story, uh, rather than as opposed to in science fiction, where it's like you know, science is usually the salvation, right. um, even if it causes some problems as well. So, 
Um, so that there was that, and then um, I probably scored some points for saying that my favorite novel was *The Stars My Destination* by Alfred Bester, which it is. Um, and also, I know I really, uh, I really trashed *The Matrix*. Uh, so you know, he uh, he probably respected that that I you know was taking I was taking a, a, a pretty negative position on something that was hugely popular at the time. Right. So. Right. So, so, so yeah, so I, do you, I got the do job. You, yeah. Do you feel like you kind of learned the, the, the editing kind of uh, realm from, from your experience of working there? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, basically almost everything I know about editing I learned from Gordon. And, uh, you know, once I, once I started working in the field and uh, I started branching out and doing other things, you know, for, uh, I mean, my job at FNSF was always uh, only part-time. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I had to try to do other things to, to make a living. And so right. I was, um, you know, I was trying to do some freelancing and I, I started doing some audiobook reviews and then I started doing uh, regular book reviews and other kind of uh, um nonfiction writing in the field like I, I did a bunch of interviews um you know for a while i was interviewing people like basically every day for for sci-fi wire which was like the the, the news segment of the sci-fi channel's website and uh i was doing like these little short interviews so i mean i must have interviewed you know hundreds if not thousands of of people <laughs> um i mean basically i mean almost everybody who was working in the field just because like whenever they had a new book it'd be like oh okay well that's that's newsy enough to to qualify for an interview um and uh, so I was doing that for a while, and that was uh, supplementing my income. But it was also teaching me a lot about uh, other aspects of the field, and it was, giving, it was building up my contacts and and that kind of thing. And so, but yeah, I mean, as far as the actual work of editing, I mean, yeah, I just basically learned that all from Gordon. Um, and then once I started trying to branch out into doing anthologies, uh, Ellen Datlow was actually uh, hugely uh, helpful to me as well. Um, you know, I just sort of met her uh, through Gordon. Um, she has she has like a, a lunch group that that meets occasionally in New York, and uh, um, you know, I was invited along to that. And uh, for whatever reason, she took a liking to me, and you know, was able was willing to help me out when I was asking for advice. And you know, so uh, I mean, like my anthology contract that I use with my authors, uh, you know, that's basically just a copy of what she sent me. Um, and, uh, so that was really helpful. And then also just, uh, you know, the proposals that I write are basically built on the template that she sent me. You know, I, I, you know, I asked, you know, could you send me a proposal for one of your anthologies that sold? And so she did. And, and I mean, that was just hugely helpful, wow. um, you know, just to see what it, what it looks like. Cause you know, I honestly, I don't think I've ever seen that anywhere. Um, right. you know, like in a book or anything. And, uh, I mean, you know, cause there's plenty of books on writing. There's not a whole lot of books on, um, how to become a editor in the science fiction and fantasy field or anything. Sure. And, and what was the process like for you once you, you were working part-time at fantasy and science fiction and, um, the, these other jobs that you mentioned writing the interviews for sci-fi wire, what was the process like for you when you started working on your first anthology project and getting that published? Well, uh, it's sort of a complicated history, but um, so the first anthology I sold successfully was Wastelands, and uh, but prior to that, I had actually tried to sell a couple other things. Um, actually, so Wastelands grew out of um, Wastelands, which is a post-apocalyptic anthology, um, a post-apocalyptic reprint anthology. I uh, uh, I actually that's that's um, built from the ashes of of my proposal to do an original post-apocalyptic anthology, um, which I tried to shop around a couple years before that. Um, and because you know the thing is, it's like I just I could see it in the slush pile that. Um, that uh, that there was something you know that there was that there was something happening sort of in the zeitgeist or whatever like there were so many stories being submitted on post apocalyptic on the post on the post apocalyptic theme that I, I knew that there was something happening and and so when I saw that I was like oh well now would be a good time to do an anthology and I, and it was like one of my favorite genres um actually I think the the first article I think I ever sold was actually uh, an article called. Um, Let's see. It was called a, a subgenre spotlight or something, or no? It was called. It was. It was in a magazine called Readers. It was called. In a, it was in a magazine called Three SF. It was a British magazine, mm -hmm. and they had a series called. Um, what was it called? Uh, uh, anyway, I don't remember what the series was called, but it was. Uh, it was a series of articles that was spotlighting some genre. Um, and so I did one on post-apocalyptic fiction. And so I just basically, I did all this research. I, uh, you know, I found all the novels that I could find on the subject and, and, you know, I, I listed the ones that I felt like were essential, um, to the genre. And, um, and when I was doing that, I discovered that there was really almost no anthologies on the subject, which really surprised me. And given I was really interested in short fiction, I was like, hmm. And so, uh, you know, and then given that the, the subject uh, seemed to be very popular uh, amongst writers anyway, I figured now would be a good time or then would be a good time to do an anthology. And so I, I put together a proposal, tried to sell that. Um, that didn't go anywhere. Um, unfortunately, I think I was a little bit too ahead of the curve. Like mm -hmm. publishing didn't catch on for another couple of years. 
Um, and as it happens, I mean, Wastelands came out like at the perfect time, basically, because it was like right. It was like it was like cresting its popularity. Um, you know, the road had had come out sort of around then, and, and then it won the Pulitzer Prize, and and you know, it's like everybody everybody was suddenly realizing that oh, post apocalyptic fiction that's this big thing right now, and uh, and then Wastelands came out, and it was like oh, okay, well. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people found it uh, to their liking, so it sold very well. That's and, great. Uh, I mean, that basically that basically made my whole the whole rest of my anthology career possible because my first book did so well. Um, and then it didn't hurt that the Living Dead, which I followed it up with, did even better. But right. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, I uh, uh, basically uh, the only anthology that I really found uh, was one called Beyond Armageddon, um, and that was a reprint anthology of post apocalyptic fiction. But it was published in like 1985, and so I basically put together Wastelands as a spiritual successor to that. Uh, you know, basically under the understanding being I wasn't going to reprint anything that was included in that book, and I'd focus on the stuff published since then. Um, and so I, I that's what I mainly did with Wastelands. I also did find some stuff that was published, bef- you know, during that time frame that Beyond Armageddon could have included, but they didn't for whatever reason. Um, and uh, so I mean, that was the basic focus uh, of the anthology and. Uh, and actually, it came together really easily. I was really surprised. I've had, I've, I've done anthology since then, even with more experience. That turned out to be much more difficult and complicated to assemble. Um, and it was just like, it was almost just like, I, I, it came right off the top of my head. I mean, it's like I, I, I threw together a, a list of, uh, a list of stories from my table of contents um, for my proposal for, for the proposal. And I mean, what, what, what was in the proposal and what ended up on the book was almost, uh, almost exactly the same. So um, it worked out really well that, uh, you know, just the, the favorites that came to mind immediately for me, just, you know, that ended up being, yes, that is what I want to include in the book. So that's great. And, and what is the process like for you? Do you usually go to, to, to the literary agents or, or directly to the authors in terms of um, getting the rise to the stories? Uh, well, for the most part, uh, short fiction is uh, uh, is controlled by the author themselves. They don't usually have their agents representing that stuff because right. there's not really enough money in it for the agents. Gotcha. Um, but some authors, yeah, some agent, some agents do represent uh, their author's fiction. Like for instance, Stephen King is is you know so big that he has people who are handling that for him. Um, but uh, for most authors, I think uh, I think every author in Wastelands probably, except for King, uh, was I dealt with them directly. Or, or well, Gene Wolfe also has a has, has an agent that represents his, his short fiction. But gotcha. um, yeah, most authors you go just go directly to them. Um, and and agents, um, you know, agents obviously it, it makes it a little bit more complicated because uh, they might not. They might not be as readily they might not readily agree, agree to um, your contract as, as much as the authors would, um, and you know they might make it more complicated by asking you to change this or that, and they might ask for more money, and that might mean that you can't use the story because <laughs> you know you can't afford it. But um, but the bigger issue is when the publisher owns the rights to something because sometimes what happens is like you know you sell a collection of your stories when the publisher buys that they buy the right to control who reprints those stories right and then when that happens it's always it's almost always a disaster uh, for future reprints because the publishers almost always overvalue what they think their short stories are worth and then they just they ask for something ridiculous that that no one could possibly you know, afford to put in an anthology. Right. Um, and actually, I mean, that happened, that happened once with Wastelands. Um, I won't, I won't name the publisher or the author just to, uh, protect the publisher sure, and, and sure. to also to not make the author feel bad if he happens to hear that he missed out on being in Wastelands. But, um, there was an author who, I mean, honestly, you've probably never heard of, um, but he wrote, he writes sort of literary type fiction mostly, but he had this great post-apocalyptic story and it was in his collection, and it was a major publisher that published it, and um, they controlled the rights. And, and I asked to reprint it, and uh, I went through this whole rigmarole of, of, you know, it's a complicated process to actually request a reprint from a publisher like that. And, uh, um, you know, so I, I requested it, and uh, they came back with an offer that was like 13 times what I had offered. So I was like, um, I can't even really negotiate with this. I mean, when, when, I, when I offered this much, and you, asked, and you offered something 13 times as much, we're not even talking the same language here. Um, <laughs> and also, it, like, the contract was also complicated and would have screwed up, uh, you know, f- uh, sub-rights deals that I could have gotten for Wastelands, like selling it in foreign editions or whatever. Right, right. Um, and it, just, like, it was just like, there's no way I can use this story. And, I mean, I'm still sad I didn't get to include it. But, um, yeah, I mean, like, no one's ever going to reprint that story because, <laughs> because of the way they, uh, they, ask, they ask for uh, uh, so much money. So. Gotcha. Well, I mentioned that you just launched Nightmare Magazine, a monthly electronic magazine, and you've been editing and publishing Lightspeed for a couple of years. What has that experience been like for you with both Lightspeed and now launching Nightmare? Do you, feel, do you find it any different than the editorial process at, at Fantasy and Science Magazine for Fantasy and Science Fiction? 
Well, I mean, it's been really it's been really exciting and interesting to to step into this role and to you know because I mean like shortly after I started working at FNSF, I realized that you know I wanted to do that for a living and uh, and and it wasn't long after realizing that that I was like, well, I want to do this for a living, but I want to be in the big chair. You know, I want to be in Gordon's chair. Um, I want to be the one making the call on what stories get included in the magazine. And um, and I mean, I knew I wasn't going to be able to 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 do that at FNSF because Gordon was also the publisher and uh, he he was only ten years older than me, so he probably he was not likely to retire anytime soon. He was also not likely to fire himself. So um, I, uh, I figured I had to go off on my own. And uh, and so when I got the opportunity to do Lightspeed, um, I mean, that was very exciting. And uh, um, I really, I, I've been really happy with what we've been able to accomplish with the magazine because, I mean, we, I mean, we basically are, are making it, making it work as a, making a free electronic, a free electronic magazine work, um, you know, and yet be financially, uh, you know, in the black, you know, so we, well, it's we're not able free, to, uh, is it? to, what's that? Uh, Lightspeed so is what? not free, is it? Well, uh, Lightspeed is free to read on the web, but then we also sell ebook issues. Oh, okay. Gotcha. gotcha. And, okay. um, the idea being that we give away the individual stories on the website and, uh, but then we also publish the ebook issues. So, like, if you want it in the nice ebook format, which is like conveniently delivered to your Kindle or whatever, um, you know, you'll you'll pay for the right to do that, and you can subscribe and and all that kind of stuff. But then also, like, if you just would prefer to read the stories online, I mean, you can do that too. So we sort of have the best of both worlds. We have we get we have the ability to you know get good marketing because people will link to a story that they really liked, and their friends can go read it, and then maybe they'll become a fan of the magazine, and maybe they'll think it's worth uh, subscribing to it. Um, and uh, so, I mean, and, and yet at the same time, we're selling we're selling ebook issues and, and that's and that helps us, uh, you know, make enough money that we're covering our costs and, and making some money. So. Um, so, I mean, it's it's been exciting to be able to do that um, because uh, there haven't been a whole lot of other magazines that have made that work. And, um, you know, prior to that, like free online fiction had really mostly been. Um, uh, a loss leader for various uh, publications, like like Sci Fi Channel had Sci Fiction. That was just a you know that they weren't making any money on that. Right. Um, I mean, they never tried to monetize it. They probably could have. It's kind of sad that they never tried. Um, but I mean, of course, there were there were magazines like Clark's World who were doing that. Um, I, I don't know how successfully they were doing it at that point, but um, certainly uh, both they and and, and Lightspeed and, and now Nightmare um, were all doing uh, fairly well um, in that regard. And 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 the and the and the business models it just works. That's um, great. So, are, are you surprised that there yeah. haven't been more uh, electronic magazines that are short story focused? And, and do you think we'll see more of them now that the publishing curve is getting simpler and simpler? Mm. Um, I'm not sure that I, I'd say I'm, I'm surprised. I mean, there actually are quite a lot. So, um, I mean, it's just a matter of like some of them are more visible than others. Sure. sure. Um, certainly, uh, certainly, like if you if if, you, if just to just as an easy way to find uh, all the different markets, if you like say look up Ken Liu's biogra- uh, bibliography, um, he's basically sold a story to almost every market that exists. It seems like, uh, and I mean, he published so much last year, um, and uh, you know, just you know, you can like see all the different places that maybe aren't uh, you know sort of the stuff that you recognize from award ballot or or maybe you just you know or maybe people don't talk about it as much but there are lots and lots of markets right now uh largely because as you say it, it is very easy to publish an online magazine now um it's a little bit more difficult i think to you know get you know sort of the best stories and to you know make make it financially feasible so that you're not just losing money tons of money every month but um you know a lot of magazines are making a go of it and i and um i mean i wouldn't be surprised if if it, if there continues to be a boom um but the thing is i think like everybody thinks that they can be an editor and and just not everybody not everybody really can do it um and I mean, obviously, uh, you know, it's sort of in my self-interest to say something like that. But I mean, I just I think it's true. I mean, it's like, um, you know, I see some of the other magazines and, and a lot of the magazines are quite good. And then some of them are just like, well, you know, this editor just really can't really tell the difference between a good story and a great story or even a mediocre story and a, and a, and a good story, you know. Um, mm-hmm. So. So, I mean, that's that's one of the problems with uh, the, the sort of proliferation is that um, you sort of worry about the field getting inundated with. Uh, you know, subpar published stuff. But um, I mean, for the most part, I think, uh, you know, I, I think that's not really ne- something to worry about because I think the people who who aren't, you know, good enough at it, you know, the, they'll maybe they'll publish a couple issues and then they'll disappear because, you know, no one's reading them or whatever. Right. Um, right. So. So w- what is the editing process like for you? Do, do you know within the first page or two whether or not you're going to want to buy a story? And is it just kind of instinctual for you? And, and do you also... 
uh, have um, authors do a lot of rewrites? Uh, well, I often know within the first page or two if I'm not going to buy a story. Um, sometimes off the, off the first page or two, I do get a feeling. I'll, I'll get a feeling like, oh, yes, this is, this is good. I like this. I hope they pull it off. You know, but it's at that point, it's like sort of like you're just hoping um, that it's that it keeps up this level of quality that, you know, all the way to the end. Um, and I mean, there's been plenty of stories that I, I really thought were great at the beginning and then they just peter out or, or, or whatever. And, and ultimately they don't work. But um, and those are always very disappointing. Um, and then there's authors who like I just I'm, I'm a fan of their previous work. And so I start reading their story. I, I, I'm thinking that it's going to be good. I'm going to buy it. But then, you know, it turns out that I didn't particularly like that one or, or whatever. Um, so I mean, it's it's a it's a very variable process. Um, you know, uh, like I said, uh, I mean, the most common thing is to know within a couple uh, to within a couple pages, I can usually tell if I'm not going to buy something. But uh, uh, occasionally, you know, I I, I mean, I do um, you know do read a story all the way through, and then just ultimately hem and haw I, I hem and haw over it, and then I'll ultimately just decide not to buy it. Um, but I also have I also have a team of uh, uh, volunteer assistants who who uh, you know I ask to uh, give me second opinions on stuff and, and that kind of thing and so sometimes I'll, I'll turn it over to them and say hey what do, you, what do you guys think of this and if they all really like it and I'm on the fence like maybe I'll take it if uh, if I'm on the fence and, and and none of them like it I'll be like okay well maybe no and if they're all on the fence then probably no as well you know um, right. so. So there's that, and then um, as far as rewrites go, I, I I don't know that I do a lot of rewrites, but um, actually in the whole in the whole field of short fiction, it seems like um, not a lot of editors uh, do spend a lot of time doing rewrites. I think largely because it's just like it's kind of a buyer's market. Um, but uh, I mean, I do a, I do a, a fair amount of re, uh, rewrite requests with authors. Uh, um, I mean, the the trouble is that it's really hard to. Uh, devote the time to something that you don't know is going to turn out to be good enough, right. you know, right. uh, because 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 uh, actually figuring out specifically what's wrong with the story to tell the author, hey, this is what I don't like about it. Can you fix this? That can take a lot of time sometimes. And, and you know, you don't know if that if that time you invest is going to pay off in the end, if they're going to be able to fix it or even if they'll be willing to fix it. Right. right. So um, so I don't do a whole lot of it. But I mean, I do I do uh, work with authors, certainly um, on occasion. Um, there have been several stories that I published that I did work up with the authors um, on on fairly significant rewrites. Um, and then sometimes sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, hey, the I, I thought this was great, but the ending just doesn't work. Can you do something about that? And, uh, you know, um, sure. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm certainly well, willing to work with authors, but it doesn't happen uh, all that often. Right. So of the anthologies you've published to date, do you have a personal favorite? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, that's a hard question to answer. It's like asking you, which is your favorite child, right? But, um, and every parent, I guess, secretly has their favorite child, but, um, they don't like to say so in public because it's just not nice. But, um, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, um, let's see. Wastelands is certainly near and dear to my heart being my first book and being a genre that I really am passionate about. Um, also Brave New Worlds, um, which I'm very pleased to, to say is being re-released in December this year. Um, uh, that actually came out in January 2011, and uh, the publisher ran into some difficulties with the distributor um, sort of partway through its publishing cycle. And so as a result, it's sort of been unavailable for a couple months uh, or almost, a, you know, basically more than a year. Um, but uh, they're finally they're re-releasing a second edition of that in uh, December, and it's going to have a few additional stories, actually. So I'm excited about that to get it back in print and get it back, uh, you know, available again. Because uh, I mean, it's definitely one of my favorite books. I think the I think the cover came out beautiful. It's certainly it's certainly among my favorite um, covers that I have. Uh, but the contents also like. You know, as much as I was proud of Wastelands having having there having been so few books, uh, so, so few anthologies on postapocalyptic fiction, for dystopian fiction, I don't think there was any. I mean, I I was astonished I, when I was like deciding on to try to do that theme. I, I was looking looking around. And it's like no one had ever tried to do a uh, a book that collected the best dystopian fiction in one anthology before, and I was I was just astounded. Um, and so, so for that reason, um, also I, I, uh, Brave New Worlds is certainly one of my favorites. Um, but then, um, but then of course there's Lightspeed Year One. Um, and I think, I, I mean, I think, I, I mean, obviously I love Lightspeed and it's, uh, you know, um, 
it's an ongoing concern. But I mean, year one, I think we did a lot of great stuff in year one. I mean, to, so we came out of the gates really strong. I mean, our, our first issue had uh, a Nebula nominee and a Hugo nominee. So that was exciting. And, uh, and, and a lot of other stuff from the first year got uh, highly acclaimed and like reprinted in best of the year anthologies and stuff. So, so a lot of the stuff in, in year one, I'm, I'm really proud of as well. And, and the book overall, that's also, that's also one of my better looking covers too. So, gotcha. um, so yeah, I mean, I guess I guess those uh, would be amongst my favorites. If you made me choose, you cruel, cruel man. <laughs> but so, uh, so as someone who reads a ton of short fiction and and also short fiction by people who are trying to get it published, uh, I know I know you can't you know go on at length. But are there like any basic mistakes that come to mind that you kind of see over and over? Or again, is it just this instinctual thing where you peop- where you find? where you feel that someone's just not there yet. But I, I just wondered if there's any way to articulate things that you see over and over that you, you like, you know, if you were talking to a group of aspiring writers that you would tell, you know, that you would give them feedback on in, in general. Yeah, you know, I mean, it is largely instinctual, like you say. I mean, you sort of get, you just get a feeling about the story, not that you can necessarily pinpoint what's wrong with it per se, or at least I can. I know there are editors who are better at that than I am. Um, but, uh, but I mean, I mean, for the most part, like, I mean, if the prose is there, like, you know, if the author's prose is good enough that it's like this story should work, uh, you know, based on just the prose, um, you know, then it's usually just like the, I mean, the story is not interesting enough, um, which I know is really vague, but I mean, it could be that they started the story too soon. Um, you know, so it's like, you know, just get to the, get to the good part already or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but I mean, it's just, it's really hard to generalize and, um, I mean, there are so many ways that stories go off the rails that, uh, that yeah, it's like it, it's just hard to it's hard to, to point to any one thing. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, the most common thing that I actually see in the slush pile is just like, you know, you can tell just from the prose that the author's not ready. And so, like, you know, if you actually are a competent um, stylist, you know, uh, that, you're, you know, that's at least half the battle. You know, like you're, you're standing above like a good, uh, a huge percentage of the writers that are in the slush pile who are really not even writing competent sentence, sentences yet on a regular basis. Right. And so... Um, you know, assuming that you have the style down, it's like, yeah, it's like, I mean, there's so many different ways that that can go wrong. It's like whether, whether they're, whether their plots are just too cliche or, you know, they, they, it's just, you know, they, they, they started the story too soon or whatever. So it's just, I mean, there's so many different reasons that the story can just not work. Um, but yeah, I mean, ultimately it is really just an instinctual thing. It's like, I, I don't know what I want, but I know it when I see it, you know? Right. So, right. um, like for instance, uh, I mean, like a lot of writers ask for more specific things about in the guidelines or, or in their rejection letters. And it's like, well, I mean, in the guidelines, like if I could tell you exactly what I wanted, I totally would. But I mean, I just, I don't know it until I see it. And, um, I mean, I'd, I'd like to be specific in the guidelines, but really all I want is I want, I want science fiction and fantasy. That's what I, I mean, for light speed, that's what I want. And, um, you know, I want to be surprised. And so, you know, I mean, if I tell you exactly what I want, I'm not going to be surprised. Sure. So, sure. And, and I know, um, I know you work with a ton of different writers and, and this may be a, a, a difficult question to ask and it may put you on the spot, but are, over the, over your editing career and over, let's say like the last 10 years of speculative fiction and, 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 and horror as well, um, are, are there any particular writers that, that really, that you would point to that, 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 you know, even if you're not publishing them yourself, your, yourself in one of your anthologies or, or one of your magazines that you, you know, as soon, as soon as you hear they have a new story, you, you rush out to grab it. Oh, sure. I mean, like Genevieve Valentine is, is a, is a writer I'm really, um, excited about. Um, and you know, I'm always looking forward to seeing new stuff by her and I'm, I'm, I'm usually jealous when I see that she sold the story to somebody else. Um, and I didn't get a look at it, but, um, but there's Genevieve, there's Ken Liu, um, you know, who was like, you know, this year's golden boy, um, you know, nominated for every award, um, you know, published a ton of stories and, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, he, he's somebody I'm always looking forward to new stuff by, I mean, they're, they're just sort of, sort of two examples of, of newer writers, but, um, you know, obviously there's, there's tons of writers who are well established that also I would have, um, the same reaction to, um, and, and they probably don't need to be named, but, um, let's see, I mean, other, other sort of new writers, like there's Brooke Brolander, I published a couple stories by her, um, including her first story, um, and, uh, so, I mean, I'm really excited to see what else she does and, um, sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, those are the ones that come to mind. Um, right. Kat Howard. Um, she's great. I mean, Rachel Swirsky, 
Um, you know, I could go on and on, obviously, but, sure, uh, sure. but I mean, those are, those are some writers that come to mind immediately as like, you know, writing exciting new stuff and, uh, you know, so, certainly at the top of my radar. Right. Well, well we talked uh, previously about Nightmare Magazine, electronic magazine. You launched it. You launched it successfully with a feed with not a feed uh, with a uh, Kickstarter campaign. Um, I just wondered about uh, the horror genre itself. W- w- what about horror do you like and do you feel like we're at kind of a a, a point where there's kind of a renaissance of, of horror literature going on? I know that, you know, some people would point to uh, a lot of the stuff going on in YA in terms of horror. Um, I, I just wonder what you what you think about the genre and where we're at today in terms of horror. Yeah, I mean, I do think that there is kind of a renaissance going on, at least in short fiction. I know in the novel realm, um, it's kind of bleak right now because um, a lot of the, uh, the, the horror imprints um, or publishers, uh, you know, they, they sort of disappeared. Like, you know, there was Dorchester Books that published a lot of horror and now they're sort of uh, insolvent. And, um, and, and a lot of the other imprints that did regularly publish horror on sort of a, you know, mass market scale um, are no longer doing so. So um, and I don't know the novel field as well, so I can't really talk about it too much. But I mean, at least in short fiction, um, there definitely does seem to be a bit of a renaissance, at least in terms of the material being produced. Um, um, and that's a large part of why I wanted to do Nightmare because, you know, the thing is, I mean, I was doing Lightspeed and I was seeing so much good horror that, I mean, I really, I mean, I did actually publish a lot of stuff that could have easily be considered just in a horror magazine instead of Lightspeed. And, and it got to be the point where I was like, well, I mean, I can't really just keep publishing all this horror in Lightspeed. I mean, I got to, I mean, you know, I mean, cause I mean, people who sign up for a science fiction and fantasy magazine, they don't really expect to have that much horror thrown at them every time, you know? Sure. And, um, so, uh, and I mean, actually, uh, so, uh, you know, Stephen Jones does the mammoth book of best new horror. And so I was preparing, um, I was preparing to send him, uh, sort of a list of stories that I had published in Lightspeed and in Nightmare so that he could consider them for the year's best. And, you know, so of course everything in Nightmare is horror, but then also in Lightspeed, I was like, well, let me see what stories I, I published in Lightspeed this year that were, that could be considered horror. And I mean, there were so many. Like I don't remember the the number off the top of my head, but I mean it was uh, it was more than ten, and you know I mean I only you know uh, let's see how many stories do I publish a year now I guess uh, forty let's see forty eight original stories, so um, you know at, at least uh, probably a good quarter of them were were sort of horrific enough that could have been in a horror magazine, um, so uh, yeah I mean it definitely seems like there's a, a renaissance going on given that, that I've been getting that much good horror um, without even trying at Lightspeed and then now with Nightmare um, and w- once we opened Nightmare actually I got so much good stuff um, right away that I was able to close the submissions after a fairly short time being open um, and so I was closed for uh, closed for about 45 days or so which was actually really convenient because I just moved house and uh, so you know uh, doing all the moving things and buying the house and doing all that stuff uh, it was nice to have uh, a little a little bit of a break from the submissions but um, but yeah I mean I had I got, you, you I got were, so you were happy with the submissions that you got once you announced Nightmare Magazine yeah, yeah, we got uh, we got a lot of great stuff right out of the gate, and uh, and you know, so I mean, I, I got enough. I, I had I had enough in inventory to like last me through the February issue, and so that's why I decided to go ahead and close for a while. Uh, because you know, in addition to being ju- in, in addition to just receiving the unsolicited submissions, I had also been soliciting a lot of stuff, and then um, and then also actually um, I was able to um, build up the inventory even more because I had I had some authors who uh, who I knew personally and I'd published before who had asked if they could send me something when we were closed, and so I was able to look at those. And, and, and bought a couple things as well, so that sort of even extended our our, our inventory. So, um, so yeah, I mean we're 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 pretty well stocked now, but I mean we're still open to submissions and always looking for new stuff. Um, and uh, I mean the yeah, I mean the the thing is, it's like uh, I mean it's because we're such a new market. I think there's a lot of people who haven't even really heard about it yet and um I'm, I'm just and now that we're open or now that we're actually i mean now that the it, the magazine's actually available i'm hoping that you know it'll really get around the whole genre and 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 you know uh i'll get i'll get submissions from all the writers who uh, uh you know that i really want to publish that i haven't uh had ha- had them submit yet um and the thing is it's like um you know uh 
you know, you know, uh, I mean, there's a lot of rosters who I solicited stories from, but uh, and they just haven't had a chance to send me stuff. But then um, I think a lot of people they were probably waiting around to see if the magazine actually did get off the ground before right. they would actually bother trying to write something. So, right. Right. Um, so I'm so I and I mean, we've done very, we launched very well. We were, you know, we had a very successful Kickstarter, and and everyone seems happy with the magazine thus far. Now that they've actually seen the contents, so um, I'm hoping that uh, that that'll be good. Great. And and, uh, and everyone will like it. Great. Well, outside of uh, Lightspeed Magazine and Nightmare Magazine, are you working on any upcoming anthologies? Uh, yeah, um, I'm doing an anthology called Robot Uprisings. Uh, that's going to be co-edited with Daniel H. Wilson, who wrote um, Robo Apocalypse and How to Survive a Robot Uprising. Um, that's going to come out in 2014, so we're working on that now. Um, next year... Next year, I have the Mad Scientist Guide to World Domination. That's coming out in February. I'm already done with that one, so um, that's uh, so I'm not working on that one. But that one's coming out soon. And actually, Epic, uh, it's a Epic is a reprint anthology of Epic fantasy stories that comes out in November. Uh, again, that one is done already, but uh, it's forthcoming. Um, and then I'm working on a couple other projects I, I can't actually announce yet, sure. but I hope to be able to announce soon. Um, oh, and then of course I'm working on Wastelands Two, which was recently announced, um, and I need to actually I need to get on Twitter and, and remind people again that I'm still open to submissions for that. Um, you know, because uh, what I do when I do these reprint anthologies now is I, um, you know, basically I do an open call saying, "Hey, I'm doing this book. Um, if you want to recommend anything, uh, please feel free to do so." And I have a little spreadsheet form set up so people can enter in their recommendations, whether it's their own story or somebody else's. And and then I also have my submission system set up for Wastelands too. So you know, if you're the author and you want to submit your story, you can just send it to me. Because you know, I mean, why not? I mean, it, it's like. That makes it a lot easier to find stuff that I might never find otherwise, and and of course I do my own research on my own too. But um, but it just helps a lot to uh, to do that kind of thing because then you can find stuff that you, maybe you wouldn't have encountered uh, just researching on your own. Great. Well, but I yeah, mentioned. So, I mean, that's basically what I'm working on right now. Yeah. Good. Good. Um, and and I mentioned earlier that you also uh, co-host a podcast as well, Geek's Guide to the Gal- Galaxy. Do you want to talk about that for a moment? H- how have you enjoyed the the you know podcast thus far? Sure. Uh, yeah, as you guys can probably guess, we uh, we spend a lot of time editing that podcast. Uh, since I sound much better on there than I do here, where I'm where I. I've been rambling a bit and stumbling over my own words. Uh, my co-host Dave does all the all the audio editing, so it's nice. He makes me sound so much smarter. Um, but uh, no, it's been great. I, I mean, we've had a lot of fun with it. I mean, Dave Kirtley is my co-host, and he, uh, you know, he, we've been friends for many years. And um, you know, we just sort of started talking about uh, the podcast. Uh, we were hanging out at my friend Rob's place one day, and we, and we're, as we often did, and, and we were just chatting. And um, and I was talking about documentaries, actually. And I was like, you know, oh, man, I'd love to do a documentary, like, you know, like on, on geek culture, like on like on our geek culture, like, you know, like Worldcon, you know, World Fantasy, like that kind of con culture, not like Comic-Con. Um, and, uh, and so we were talking about that for a while because my friend Rob actually had done some independent film production. And uh, but then uh, so I was talking to Dave about it, um, and he was like, well, I don't know about documentary, but maybe maybe we could do a podcast. Um, so we started talking about that, and then and we decided to do it, and 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 we sort of we launched on Tor.com, and then we were there for about twenty episodes, twenty one episodes, and then uh, they dropped us, um, and then we looked around to see who else might want to host it, and then io9 picked us up, um, and then we were on io9 for a while, and then they dropped us, um, but then uh, but then we got picked up by Wired.com, so. Uh, so it's actually been a weird, crazy journey for that podcast because it's like we started off. So every time we got dropped, we ended up with a place that was actually way bigger and better for, you know, giving giving us a bigger audience, um, you know, because it's like we went from like Tor.com, which I don't know what their numbers were like, but io9 is obviously bigger. And like io9 has like, I don't know, something like three million readers a month. And then we moved to Wired.com and it's like it's like 13 million readers a month. So it's like, wow, um, we're really moving on up. Yeah, but, uh, all I can say is yeah, a lot. Been... Uh, all I can say is a lot less people will listen to this podcast than yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, no, we, I mean, I, I think nearly... I think you should, I think you should be thankful. I think it's great, and and <laughs> I, I I will just add. I mean, I'll have a link to the show notes. I definitely recommend Geek Sky to the Galaxy. Anyone listening to this podcast should definitely check yours out, um, and and I definitely recommend the Juno Diaz uh, interview, which mm. uh, you recently did. I'm actually going to go back and listen to that a second time. Um, I thought it was great, and my only feedback was, oh, I wish I could. I wish I could read the uh, the speculative fiction that he's written that he's refused to publish mm. for whatever reason. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Right. You know. No. I, uh, yeah. Thanks for saying that. I, I mean, we really enjoyed that interview as well. We felt like it was one of our best that we had done. 
Um, and I mean, that's that's one of the great things about the podcast. I'm sure that's probably the same the same is true for you. Is like you know talking to all these interesting people that you know like you know you just gives gives you an excuse to sit down and talk with them for an hour or whatever and, and just like pick their brain. And um, you know, being on Wired actually really opened up the doors for us to talk to some people that we you know we we didn't really figure we'd ever be able to land. And <laughs> so we still have a few white whales out there. We got Stephen King. We got Neil Gaiman. We got to get them sometime. But yeah, uh, yeah. Stephen King, I don't know if we're ever going to hap- make happen. But uh, Neil Gaiman, I think we're we'll we'll line something up when this new adult book comes out. It's coming out next summer, I believe. So yeah, I actually, uh, I actually we're, went we're, to a I actually went to a Stephen King reading about a year and a half ago in Vermont, which was about an hour from where I live. And I actually called his assistant to try to set something up. Set something up beforehand and of course i, I was shot down mm-hmm. it didn't happen <laughs> yeah yeah but um okay well, well cool so Ge- geeks guide to the galaxy you should definitely check it out and finally um where can people find you online so that they can find these various projects and anthologies that you're that you're working on do you have a website uh, yeah yourself? if you go to if you go to if you go to john joseph i mean that's my website and uh, i actually have um uh, uh, I have a page that that's, that just lists all of my publications, all my different anthologies, and every one of my anthologies I've actually set up a sub, a little sub site um, devoted to the anthology. So like you can go to that site and you can read um, interviews with the authors, you can read free samples from the anthology, um, and so there's links to all of those little sub sites on my website, and uh, so you can sort of sample all of my books by uh, by doing that. And um, and then I'm on Twitter at, um, at John Joseph Adams and on Facebook. John Joseph Adams, you know. So basically, uh, any any of those places you can find me. But uh, the website's probably the best way. And then, of course, Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. You can go to geeksguideshow.com, and that has links to all of our episodes and information about the show and whatnot. Yep, and I'll, I'll have links to all of that in the show notes as well and links to your anthologies. Well, again, we've been speaking with John Joseph Adams, editor of Nightmare Magazine, Lightspeed Magazine, and many speculative fiction anthologies. John, thanks for doing the interview. Yeah, thanks for having me. Okay. Susan, it's so great to finally be able to get together again. Oh, it sure is. And I really appreciate you picking up the bill. I'm happy to. I've got the extra cash. Since we've all been driving so much more again, I've been using GetUpside, the free gas app that pays you cash back for every gallon of gas you buy. Wait a minute. Are you saying you actually get paid cash when you buy gas with the GetUpside app? Yes, up to 25 cents a gallon. Cash back every time I buy gas. Does that actually add up to anything? Some months I make 200 to 300 bucks. <laughs> Wow, that's serious extra cash. I'm downloading the free GetUpside app now. Download the free GetUpside app now in the App Store or Google Play to save up to 25 cents a gallon when you buy gas. Use promo code FILL for a 25 cents a gallon bonus on your first tank. That's up to 50 cents a gallon on your next fill-up. You can cash out anytime to PayPal or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Just download the free GetUpside app and use promo code FILL for a 25 cents a gallon bonus on your first tank. That's code FILL.